Yeah, I know it's not normal. Well, what can I say? It just it happened. Yes, yes. Okay. I guess this is a video. Hello, I'm Robert Ryan, and this is Ball in Europe on YouTube. And we sort of broke a story last night, which if you've followed this site pretty much ever, you know we don't really do news breaking. Like, we've broken the odd thing here and there, but, like, we leave it to the people who are actually good at news breaking in basketball to do that. Uh, you know, because they are more into it. Just not normally our thing, but, you know, if something comes across and uh, we see it, we do it. Uh, so, yeah, as you may be aware, uh, Zalgiris have taken control of the London Lions. The London Lions, uh, Stuart Hodge being the main person reporting all of this stuff, as you know, they have an awful lot of uh, recent history and drama. Uh, definitely a couple of Stuart stuff. There's a few people I'm going to have to thank uh, at the end of this video, so we'll do all that, but we're going to go through a few things. First of all is, who exactly has taken ownership of what? Then we're going to go into... A little bit of sort of explaining why it's gone along this way uh, and then we're going to look really a bit about sort of you know what realistically is the motive here for Zalgiris and uh, for the other parties involved and secondly sorry not secondly fourthly what we expect is going to happen or what could happen really not what we expect so before we get into all of that though please 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 be sure to subscribe and now on with the first thing who's exactly taking control of what So, big name to remember throughout all of this is Tom Ackerman. He's not the only person involved, but it's probably the most important name you're going to hear in this video. So just bear that in mind. So, I tweeted last night that ownership had been taken of London Lions by Zalgiris. Uh, and that's not 100% accurate, but it is actually a lot closer than what some people were reporting. I know uh, Basket News, who are great guys, they read the document which referred to it all as a loan. And I can see why they did that. They are actually a bit further from the accuracy, though, than me, because uh, basically it's a whole lot of convoluted stuff. Uh, so, ownership of literally every asset of London Lions, this includes trademarks, leases, anything you can think of, was taken, like literally in this document, ownership was taken by Zalgirish Group, which isn't technically the company that runs Zalgirish Kaunas. We'll explain why in a minute. But it does feature same prominent shareholders, including... Tom Ackman. Now, that is interesting because Zalgiris Kaunas, the basketball club again, which somehow is not also Zalgiris Group, but sort of is, uh, many of the people involved, uh, they announced that Tessonet, which is also owned by Ackman and his business partners, um, they were actually the ones taking ownership of the Lions, but that Zal Zalgiris would run it. And we're going to have a really fun time here. Company formation talk! But uh, we'll get to that in a second. So essentially, though, the key thing to bear in mind is, and why Baston News Reddit is alone, is that the two parties involved, the London Lions and Zalgiris Group, are referred to as the charger and the lender. So obviously you read lender, you're thinking alone. Welcome to company formation uh, and all the bizarre things involved deeds. So while it's listed as a loan as such, the actual details of the 60-page contract show that it's what's really known as a floating charge in British law. And that's there's many different types of charges, but a floating charge essentially allows the Zalgiris group, which is the body we're talking about here, to take ownership of essentially every asset, uh, control, crucially, of every asset. So literally everything that would be considered to do with the London Lions as an asset of theirs is fully under control of Zalgiris group. They have the say over literally every asset there. London Lions itself still exists as such, but to be at, at pretty much at the complete power of Zalgiris. Now, I should qualify, I'm not a lawyer. I did talk to a very, very smart person on the law, because uh, my other half is studying to be a lawyer, who read the document in full uh, and uh, explained the terminology and why it's different. We actually have different terms for it in Ireland. But while, so you might be going, is it a loan? Not really. And more importantly, they don't actually have to declare how much is being lent. It's essentially a case of, this is the... It's not consideration, but it's uh, that's very important to say. This is essentially the tool being used to enable the transfer of ownership. So that's who is taking charge of what. So while there's a lot of technicalities, in every effective sense you can imagine, Zalgirish now runs the London Lions. Wow, that was boring, but it's about to get duller because, like I said, company formation information time! 
Okie dokie. So, you might be going, right, what's going on here then? Well, you see, Zalgiris Group isn't the owning body of Zalgiris Kaunas. That's Zalgiris Centra. So, I'm just literally going to double check this while I'm doing this, which will also give me a chance for one of the thank yous for this, by the way. Uh, so, uh, to, to, to Law and Floater uh, on Twitter, uh, big big props. Uh, you know, you, you uh, helped me a lot with sort of the uh, ownership format of this. So, uh, there is. It's controlled by Zalgirio Krepsinio Centra, to be precise, is who are actually uh, who controls Zalgiris, the basketball club that you and I know from watching in EuroLeague. You may be going, well, why does Zalgiris group exist? Well, again, Tom Ackman. So Tom uh, is may, may not be familiar to too many of you. Indeed, the company that was mentioned in the Zalgiris press release, Tessonet, probably isn't familiar to too many of you. But company, another company that is linked to all of this, Nord Security, is suddenly starting to ring some bells. So Nord Security is uh, the company under which uh, three products you have heard about a lot on the internet uh, over the years have come up. NordVPN, Atlas VPN, and Surfshark. And I'd say more if you heard of Surfshark than Atlas. No offense to anybody who uses Atlas there. I don't actually use any of them at the moment, by the way. Uh, so, because I'm boring and I just got a McAfee and it's enough for me. Uh, I may change at some point, who knows? But they own all of those, which, of course, if you watch YouTube ever, those are advertised a lot. But company owners was like, why are they these, these different things? Like, why does Algiris Group exist when you've already got this other, the centrist company, I'm just going to call it? Well, essentially, this comes back to Paulis Matiunas, who, of course, is the CEO of EuroLeague. And I'm just making sure I get the pronunciation right there. So, yep, you're seeing me going to pause for one second. And back, yes, I did pronounce Paulis' name correct. Thank you. So Paulis Matiunas uh, was a shareholder in the Zalgiris we all know and love. But when Paulis became CEO of EuroLeague, he obviously had to give that up because conflicts of interest. Like, he would essentially have been representing both a club in EuroLeague and the interests of the league at the same time, which is bad. Uh, like, not saying Paulis would have done anything, but... It looks really terrible. Police is aware of this and took the necessary corporate actions one does when one does this. Like, we've seen a lot with people having to divest from certain things to take an interest in something else because, again, conflicts of interest. That's why often, for example, those of you who may be aware of, uh, you know, how PR companies work, they typically say you might have one airline but can't represent another or one bank can't represent another, largely speaking. They have to divide things out. So that's a classic example there. So that's why Zalgiris Group essentially exists to enable that separation so that where Mati Yunus would still have some interest purely in a commercial basis with this other company, he no longer has interest in Zalgiris Centris. But the key thing is, Ackman, Tom Ackman and his buddies, all on the Tessonet, Nord Security, all that world, are hugely uh, important shareholders in both the Zalgiris companies we're talking about here, the Group and Centris, and obviously Tessonet as well. So they're sort of, you know, the glue for all of this. So that sort of enables all of these things to be managed in different ways because you have got one key shareholder. Ackman has, I think it's a 45% share in Zalgiris, something like that. It was like him and his uh, cohort have that share. Uh, and so that naturally gives a lot of security for all related businesses knowing that there's an interest in not messing about each other because of the shared ownership model effectively. But it also allows some other stuff. Uh, for example, Euroleague does not allow the same person to own um, more than one club, again, conflict of interest-wise. So again, there'll be ways to manage that going forward. Which, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, guess he forgot what his third heading was and is going to be really regretting this now. There's a pause here. So yes, as you can tell, this has been a stressful one to put together that I had to take a pause there to remember that. My third point is the motive, like what's in it for Zalgirish? Uh, and by Zalgirish, I mean everybody involved. So Tom Ackman, all his cohort, uh, the entire Zalgirish group, including, uh, you know, Paulius Matiunas. Indeed, Paulius in his position as CEO of Euroleague, Euroleague itself. Uh, pretty much everybody but the London side, because the London side is very easy to explain, they needed someone to take ownership. And um, note I'm saying take ownership because there may only be a nominal consideration here, if any consideration at all, given it's a floating charge as opposed to a formal purchase, so to speak. So take ownership is the correct term, and that was confirmed by a lawyer partner, thanks Shabangi, uh, rather than buy. So the motive, well, pretty simple to be honest. 
you've got an asset here which is a disaster right now. I mean, uh, in terms of where it currently sits. Obviously, there was all the losses built up. They had to pull the women's team entirely as soon as they won Euro Cup from the uh, European competition altogether. They were obviously going to go into women's Euro League women. And uh, the men's team uh, semi-finals of Euro Cup had pulled out of that. Had a, the, B, the BBL had effectively collapsed. We saw all that drama. Uh, Stuart Hodge, who I mentioned earlier, covered that extremely well over the last while. There was a lot of drama at London Lions, and basically there wasn't really anything of, of value there, except the name, uh, literally. Uh, the name London Lions uh, and obviously some of the other things which they had access to so those access to assets even though they technically were assets uh, is the key thing there in that there's something when you've got something basically you can get for nothing and you can then rebuild it there's a potential to create value there you obviously don't want to make the mistakes that uh, the previous ownership of the Lions did you don't want to be doing quite as much uh, out there in terms of overspending, for example, and uh, not and, and also under delivering in terms of revenue, Zalgiris is obviously one of the smartest organisations in European basketball, if not European sport, when it comes to being able to maximise revenue generation from a relatively limited market. Like you see the size of uh, Lithuania's market, you see the relative GDP per capita. Then you look at sort of the size of the Zalgiris Arena, the power of that Zalgiris brand name, the sheer amount of support they get, the sheer amount they're able to do in terms of revenue generation. Compared comparative to their size, they're a success. And obviously we've seen that translate into fairly solid on-core performance because again, relatively speaking, compared to some of the budgets and what not they're going up against, they aren't as strong, but they are able to punch above their weight because of essentially great corporate and front office intelligence. They're really good assets. And these are assets they can use to help with London. Uh, this is why Zalgiris will be running it. London's a very different market, but it does have a couple of things going for it. There is, in the region of 50 to 60,000 people who uh, are Lithuanian or consider themselves Lithuanian, living in the London area, mostly in the east side as well, which is where London Lions were based. They play out of the copper box. So again, regional reach to that community. Then there's naturally the native basketball community, the existing Lions fan base, and how you build off that. So there's a lot of stuff to work with there, which right now, you know, overspending basically meant, meant was wasted. But a team, an organization which is smarter and more... I say organic, but I really just mean intelligent in terms of its development, uh, can do an awful lot with. There's an awful lot you can do to make this a far more viable asset than it is right now. So what's going to happen? Well, the end game, there's a couple of questions. One, can London be a Euroleague team? It's always been the great dream of Jordan, you'd be called. It's still certainly an interest for Euroleague itself because of the sheer size of the London market. And like for me, it's a huge challenge because I've written multiple pieces about it. I will link to a few of them uh, below. And <laughs> putting it mildly, I'll link to a few of them below. Uh, because while lo big markets are tough to break for a reason, that is the extent of competition when you're dealing with a market of that size and that value. So, well, you might go, but there's lots of room. Well, actually, a lot more is competing for that room than you might find in uh, Kaunas, than you might find in a Vittoria Gastez. Uh, you know, it's uh, you might go, but these are tiny markets, yes, but they're also much more easy to control markets in some respects, obviously with a greater ceiling on their maximum value you can garner from them. Wow, this is a really big basketball video, isn't it? Not a business video in disguise. Oh, God. Uh, but... Essentially, there's that potential. Naturally, there comes the uh, conflicts issue there, which does lead to a few potential options, though, for the current ownership. Uh, well, the new ownership, rather. And you can see I've got my little Zalgiris cap in the background. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't fit my head, but I keep it there anyway, because, you know, gotta love the whole Zalgiris thing. Uh, and so, the options, well, they could eventually be a Euroleague level team. It's not entirely impossible uh, with the right management, with the right uh, thinking, with the right market understanding. It's going to take a lot longer than uh, the previous owners for London was thinking, just to be clear, to make it worthwhile, but and certainly to make it like financially viable, financially manageable. And um, it's an option, but then you get to, well, what about the conflict of interest? Well, there's a couple of options there. One is that it is technically under a different ownership, could be an argument, although Tessonet and its shareholders, including Tom Ackman, having a clear financial interest in both Zalgiris and London Lions would be an issue. Now, Ackman could opt to divest from uh, one or the other, but let's assume he's more likely to divest for Lions. And you might go, but like, 
The London's a higher capital market, yeah, but I, you would feel that Tessanet, because of their Lithuanian base, uh, Lithuanian, uh, you know, growth, uh, the logical thing would be to stay with the, maintain the ownership of, of Zalgiris. But essentially, divestor, uh, divestment of ownership is the way forward with that. And that's a posh way of saying, selling it for a lot more than you paid for it and spent on it. Because if you do find a way, in Zalgiris' case, to make this a successful and actual high revenue drive, uh, entity, the potential to actually attract uh, a, a, another investor, like be it a VC, be it a, some sort of a speculator, be it a you know somebody who's just got more money than sense. There's lots of options out there. Does increase the way it was being previously one was never going to attract an investor of that nature because they were kind of going to go. This is a disaster. This is just a money pit. If you turn what has just been a money pit into something that's an actual viable going concern that's going to be something that can attract interest and you're already in an attractive city uh, for those sort of investors and we've seen as well like the um, level at which you know sort of a billionaire will invest in terms of prestige of club has dropped essentially when i say billionaires but i really mean like people worth in the hundreds of millions uh, because being worth in the hundreds of millions is still quite a lot of money but it's price people out of for example for the most part buying a top tier Premier league club uh, buying most top tier clubs in the big five leagues in european football and in other sports as well you've seen that where the people have been able to come in who are by any reasonable definition wealthy but not in that like super super level like the one percent of the one percent of the one percent um you know it's like if you're in that like sort of second tier down of one percent you're still really 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 rich and uh, yeah, you might want to still have a nice plaything. But again, not even that. Could be actual other investors developing as an asset. So there's a lot of things that can be done here. Now, I've got a few people I've got to thank. So I'm pulling the phone out. The first and foremost, without shadow of doubt, is Shibangi Karma Car, my partner, who uh, read through the contract for me and really, really made my life so much better. Vilnius A, who was explaining some stuff to me last night as well. Really big help, thanks to them. Thanks to Law and Floater as well. A uh, huge thanks to Stuart Hodge, by the way, who for all his reporting across the last year plus on London Lions, I'm going to say. Uh, like, because obviously he's been a valuable resource for all of us uh, journalists across Europe. And a huge thanks to you for watching me talk businessy stuff for uh, way longer than you probably wanted me to. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, and even if you didn't, please subscribe. We need to keep boosting that up. And yeah, wow. Uh, thanks for your time, everybody. Have a good day.